Joining us now to go in depth on ISIS, retired Master Sergeant Scott Neal. He spent 25 years in U.S. Special Forces, led multiple combat operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and also in the Horn of Africa. Scott, it is so good to have you back this morning, Skyping in from Tampa here on America's Forum. Uh, thank you for having me once again and uh, for giving us a voice as well. Well, we want you to lend your voice and expertise to what our Secretary of Defense said yesterday, Chuck Hagel calling ISIS apocalyptic beyond anything we've seen. Now, that's a very powerful description. We've seen that horrific video. Um, but is ISIS really 10 feet tall? Actually, they're not. You know, they're a notion, this idea, this concept uh, born from al-Qaeda, this superior caliphate. And what you've seen is it's almost turned into a summer camp for wayward boy, boys. You have a lot of uh, foreigners joining the cause. They're really recruiting heavily in the in the virtual space and they're coming and joining the fight and that's where you see this terrorization across northern iraq it's almost as if you know they're, they're wanting to do these acts of atrocity just to bolster their machismo but what you've seen with the airstrikes lately as soon as they're hit and they're countered they turn tail and run and the leadership goes back into syria and, and speaking of syria the lead story on our uh, website uh, newsmax.com uh, says ISIS cannot be defeated without going into Syria. And we see it there from our parent website, Newsmax.com. Do you agree operationally or tactically with that assessment? Do uh, someone, someone, whether it's special forces, somebody's got to go into Syria to get ISIS? Is that accurate? Well, you know, personally, I believe so. Once again, we've seen this, what happened with the whole foreign fighter network that would organize itself in Syria and then would come into Iraq in 2006, 2007 and really wreak havoc on the American forces. It's the same thing going on with the Taliban senior leadership in Afghanistan. If you give them sanctuary, they're able to reorganize. Uh, they're doing black market activity with some of the oil wells that they're capturing. And you're really not getting to the hornet's nest and taking care of the situation. Uh, Scott, we have heard that uh, the administration is treating the, the execution of James Foley as a crime. It is sending the FBI in to investigate. Is, is that something that should be taking place, or was this an act of war requiring a, a military response? Before we get your answer on that, let's take a listen to what the Attorney General had to say on this yesterday. Uh, and those who would perpetrate such acts need to understand something. Um, this Justice Department, this Department of Defense, um, this nation, uh, we have long memories, and our reach is very wide. Uh, we will not forget what happened, and people will be held accountable one way or the other. Well, you hear this, and it sounds as if uh, the Attorney General and others want the FBI to go in, capture whomever did the beheading, and haul them back to America for a trial. Are we not at war? Is this not an act of war, Scott? Well, it's very interesting. We're, we're debating amongst ourselves if we think we are at war, but yet the person and the group and and this uh, radical you know organization believes they are totally at war. So to have the false premise that we're going to find that one individual, uh, expend all of this national intelligence and energy to get him and then parade him in lower Manhattan at a court uh, is just false. You really have to attack you know, the ideology we have to attack in the virtual space, and certainly we have to root out the leadership. And that one person cutting off that other person's head uh, really, you know, is not the problem. It is, uh, but it certainly has provided powerful evidence and served as a catalyst for renewed awareness here in the United States. Now, before we saw that horrific video, we saw different types of video akin to uh, almost the games kids play, and that, of course, the video of the airstrikes, the targeted airstrikes that American air power has brought in in support of Iraqi and Kurdish forces. Uh, air power is one thing, but now will we have to add elements of special forces to go in and try to neutralize ISIS? Yes, and if you recall back in the early days of uh, after 9-11, it was less than 230 special forces, special operators, and interagency personnel that went into Afghanistan. Some came even in horseback. 
over the mountains, uh, raised guerrilla armies, uh, really linked the Afghans to defend themselves. And under 90 days, we had pushed uh, the Taliban out of Afghanistan and also Al Qaeda. And everybody's fascinated right now about this precision strike, which wasn't a failure. It was successful. And uh, I've done a lot of these operations, and sometimes they're just not there. But once again, there is special forces in the area. It's just, are they being able to do what they need to do? Well, uh, you mentioned the strike, and we need to talk more about that. Uh, this was the mission that was assembled to go in and find Foley and others, and they had been moved by that point in time. My concern is not with the, uh, the rescue attempt, but with the Pentagon releasing so many of the details on this. Aren't our special forces reliant on uh, secrecy in terms of not only of, of what works but what doesn't? And also just some of the reports I've seen have been very detailed about the level of American forces, what assets they were using and what their intent was. Was that wise to put out uh, yesterday and the day before? Uh, certainly it wasn't. In, in any type of operation like that, you need certain tenants to become successful. You need speed, surprise, and violence of action. And it's the combination and the details of the operation that you need to keep secret because once you start showing your hand, and now we're just basically telling you know folks that we're coming, get ready for us, this is how we're going to do it, you know, ultimately it really puts those special operators at risk tremendously because you really only have a certain amount of options available to you to be successful. And, and with that, uh, our commander in chief is on vacation. I, I guess we have no way of authorizing or of understanding who exactly authorized the release of the information or do we, do you have any idea on why that decision was made at the Pentagon, the state department and other parts of our national security apparatus? Well, certainly, if you look at the two sides of the political spectrum and the benefit to national security and security policy, it obviously didn't come from national security policy side. So it really came from a political side. And sometimes, you know, it seems lately that, you know, anytime it's convenient to reach into the barrel of, of secrets and pull out something shiny, uh, this administration, you know, tends to do that to a degree that I've never seen before. Uh, before we let you go, about a minute and a half remains. We're going to literally bring it back home. Texas Governor Rick Perry reacted to the ISIS video, saying that ISIS and organizations like ISIS may have already penetrated our porous borders. Let's listen to the governor together. So I think there is the obvious great concern that because of the, uh, of the condition of the border from the standpoint of it not being secure, and us not knowing who is penetrating across, uh, that uh, individuals from ISIS or other terrorist states could be, and, and I think that it's a very real uh, possibility that they may have already used that. Uh, about a minute left. Do you agree with Governor Perry's assessment? Uh, I agree in, in two different ways. One, you know, in, in some of my previous activities, you know, the border is a prime position, and everybody uh, knows that, from the drug lords to transnational crime to certainly terrorism. And we've, we've found information to that regard. But the other discussion is, is, you know, we don't even know how many Americans are going over there and joining ISIS. And it's almost like summer camp. They'll go and participate for a while, and they'll come back home and they'll become recruiters and agents with that ideology. And of course, so, the whole notion, Scott, that they could actually take a hostile action back here at home is something we have to keep our eye on as well. Scott Neal, we thank you very much for your time and your input. We'll visit again soon. Coming up, did James Foley's deep Christian faith seal his fate with ISIS? Our panel on ISIS and religious persecution coming up. Stay tuned.